Great. I think it's time to kick off. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm Rose Payne. I'm the Digital Policy Manager at the International Chamber of Commerce. We represent 45 million businesses worldwide. So that's everyone from your huge multinational corporations down to MSMEs. Um, so I'm from pretty much every single sector. Um, so just first of all, some housekeeping. As you can see, we have two mics in traditional IGF fashion. I'll ask you to queue up behind them when we have the Q&A session, which will be towards the end of this panel. Great, so this panel, which is entitled All Hands on Deck to Connect the Next Billions, will take a deep dive into connectivity and digital divides. Today, almost a third of the world, some 2.6 billion people remain offline. We've made huge strides in expanding connectivity, but clearly we still have a long way to go. So this issue has deep-rooted causes, and it's important to understand that it's not just a matter of be people being able to connect. So earlier in the conference, Doreen Bogdan-Martin, the Secretary General of ITU, mentioned that the proportion of women relative to the proportion of men who are offline is actually increasing. The persistent gender digital divide shows that the reasons for digital exclusion are complicated. This is as much of a social problem as a technological challenge. Do people have the skills to use digital technologies? Are there relevant services and content that they want to use that motivates them to be online? What are their experiences like when they use technologies? Do they feel safe and secure? That's why we often refer to meaningful connectivity. Infrastructure and devices are really one part of the puzzle. So we're going to start with an exploration of where we are today. Where does the connectivity gap actually stand and why? Why, why is there this persistent digital divide? The session isn't just about discussing problems. It's also about finding actionable solutions. So that's what we'll discuss next. We'll identify the right policy environment that encourages investment and how to create cross-sector partnerships. This workshop brings together experts in policy and technology who are dedicated to delivering universal connectivity using various technologies, economic and business models, and policy and regulatory approaches. Our goal is to learn from their experiences and discuss concrete solutions that can be applied or scaled up to ensure meaningful connectivity for everyone, everywhere. We're very lucky to be joined by these experts who work with the technology actually delivering connectivity, people who are carrying out essential research to help us understand barriers, and people delivering programs that help to overcome them. So without further ado, ado, I'm going to introduce you to our panel today in the order that they will speak. So joining us online, we have Atsuko Okuda, who works for the International Telecommunications Union, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, where she is the regional director. We have Takashi Motohisa, Manager of International Regulatory Affairs for Project Kuiper at Amazon. We have Pablo Barrio Nuevo, Public and Corporate Affairs Manager at Telefonica. We have Joe Welsh, who is Vice President of Global Public Policy for the Walt Disney Company, who focuses on the Asia Pacific. We have Machuki Mwanga, Distinguished Technologist for Internet Growth at the Internet Society. We have Anika Makwaka, Makwaka, sorry, co-executive director at the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership. And finally, we have Giacomo Percy Paoli, head of the Security and Technology Program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. Great. So to begin, Atsuko Akuda, who's joining us online, will begin with a presentation on the state of digital inclusion today. Atsuko, I hope you can kick us off now. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our appreciation to invite ITU to this very important session. And I hope that uh, um, we can support and contribute with the uh, statistics and analysis that we have done uh, for this session. Now, um, 
Next slide, please. I would like to start with a very short presentation on uh, what ITU is. ITU, as many of you may know, is the oldest UN agency specialized in information and communication technologies. And we have three distinctive areas of specialties. One is the radio communication uh, uh, dealing with the spectrum allocation as well as satellite of it. Second, standardization supporting the uh, SMEs and industry uh, to develop the, uh, the technologies, including emerging technologies. And third, assisting member countries to connect the unconnected and meaningful digital transformation. Next slide, please. So I would like to start with the bigger picture on SDGs. And I'm not sure if participants have seen this slide uh, in the previous sessions. And this is the highlight of where we are in terms of achieving the SDGs by 2030. In Asia and the Pacific, we have passed already 2022, but we are nowhere near. And it's unlikely that we can achieve uh, all SDG goals by the time. One SDG goal, we are seeing even the regression. So there is a high expectation that digital technology and connectivity will really accelerate not only the um, connectivity part, but through connectivity, the achievement of social economic development. Next slide, please. So to answer your question uh, in terms of where we are, um, according to the latest statistics, um, it is estimated that there will be 2.6 billion people still offline uh, as of 2023. Now, for some of us who have been following the numbers, there have been steady improvement in the numbers. Um, the previous number uh, last year was 2.7. So there is, you can see a significant uh, uh, progress. However, the two years before that, during the COVID, we have seen a much, much faster uh, progress. Almost 800 million people joined during the short period of two years under COVID. So we can see that this pace of connecting the unconnected is slowing down. And I believe that this is one of the concerns that uh, we have and we share across the globe. Next slide, please. So the next slide goes a little bit deeper into the digital divide and how it could look like. As you know, ITU collects uh, the various aspects of ICT development globally and time series. So this is one uh, presentation on the data analysis that we have done. We can clearly see that there's a regional uh, a variation uh, globally, as well as gender a gap between men and women and how many uh, internet users are there in each group, as well as um, the affordability gap. These are some of the prominent features of a digital divide that we have. Um, next slide, please. We also have a very clear urban digital, uh, urban rural divide, as well as generational uh, divides. And um, this is the, um, granular view of uh, uh, internet users and how many, uh, what's the percentage of internet users in each um, region, as well as per income groups. And you can clearly see that low income uh, countries have much, much less internet users. And the same applies to LDCs and LLDCs, which is the least developed countries and landlocked developing countries. Next slide, please. And um, I would also like to go a little bit deeper into the affordability. As uh, um, you may know, the broadband service affordability is measured. There is a benchmark, 2% uh, GNI per capita. And over and above that, it is considered not affordable. And below that, uh, people can, a number of a, a population can access and enjoy the service. And this is a snapshot in terms of which countries have affordable and unaffordable uh, uh, mobile broadband baskets as of 2022. And we can see that those countries with unaffordable uh, broadband services have much, much less internet users. Next slide, please. So, um, 
we believe that the challenges of connecting the unconnected, as you have seen uh, in the previous uh, graphs and charts, can be summarized in this problem and solution trees. Of course, this is a high level summary. You may have different uh, perspectives as well as the elements, but from where, where we see to connect the unconnected in remote and rural areas, we believe that they are actual investment, physical connectivity issue, affordability issue on the part of consumers, as well as digital skills, and the lack of services and applications that can bring the concrete digital benefits to the, uh, the communities and uh, uh, population. Next slide, please. So in order to turn those uh, challenges into opportunities, we believe that perhaps and in the context of slowing down of our progress in connecting the unconnected, perhaps we need a qualitatively different approach to the, uh, uh, to the issue to uh, narrow the digital divide. And one of the um, approaches that we have been advocating is this whole of government approach and whole of a society approach. Because what is plaguing the smaller economies in particular is a siloed approach that to connect the uh, unconnected schools or hospitals or farmers, we have different initiatives, but we believe that by connecting these different groups and sectors, perhaps we can create efficiencies and economies of scale. And there's a lot we can gain by collaborating and through partnership. So this slide shows what that means concretely as an ICT initiative. And we start with SDGs on the left-hand side. And in the middle, in the capital, in the center, in the government, we believe that we can create a whole of government and digital government services that can uh, build the uh, to support the education, health, and agriculture without breaking the silos and without creating a separate systems and infrastructure. And we hope that that will be delivered to the communities and people through smart cities and smart villages and smart islands. And we hope that there will be a smooth transition from SDG to the actual benefit to the communities. Next slide, please. So what does then the smart village, smart island could look like? And this is a very high level overview and summary. So as I said, we need a whole of government approach in the center that can provide education and health and commerce agriculture and so forth based on a common building blocks as you see on the left hand side which could be a national id it could be a one payment mechanisms one could be a messaging now that will be translated into the village in the mean in the middle of the slide which is a low cost scalable and multi-sector uh, collaboration platform that is within the remote village and islands that will provide e-health and e-agriculture and those services to the people. Next slide, please. So in ITU, as an example, we have about 15 countries that we are rolling out this initiative and I'll be happy to provide more details later on. Next slide, please. So um, this is my last slide. I believe that in order to materialize the the whole of government approach and whole of society approach requires also a whole of um, support approach, the partnership among all of us, so that when we see an opportunity for synergies and partnership, we can join hands and to make sure that there will be um, one, perhaps, uh, solutions to address the issue instead of two or three uh, different solutions. And we believe that through this partnership and joining hands, we can provide a qualitatively different support to the member countries and target communities. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I have a QR code in case you are interested in knowing these initiatives. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Back to you, thank you. Thank you so much. I think that that was um, a really fantastic framing of not, of first of all, why this is so important. Um, connectivity, 
doesn't just lead to economic growth, it also can help to achieve global goals and also help potentially help us get back on track with the SDGs. Um, we also heard that uh, the kind of complexity of this issue and the need for really innovative solutions which take an ecosystem approach. So I'm going to ask the rest of the panelists for their, for their reactions, starting with Takashi. Um, so you work for Amazon's Project Kuiper, who are addressing how to connect some of those really hard to reach areas using low Earth orbit satellites. What can you share about how the private sector is, is really innovating technologically to close the gap? Thank you. Yep. First of all, I would like to state that I'm very excited to be part of this session. And then um, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to discuss how to bridge the digital divide globally with the experts from the uh, many variety of the field. That's a very fantastic chance for me because bridging the digital divide is um, exactly the mission of the project Kuiper that Amazon is working on. And then this is also my personal motivation and then personal reasons that I'm working for in this project. So, yeah, let me talk about the project Kuiper as an example of the private sector is working for this bridging the digital divide. And I think, yeah, thank you. Yeah, please go back to the. Thank you. Oh, oh that's good. <laughs> please go to the next slide. Thank you. And project Kuiper is a uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Go back to the second slide. Thank you. This is Project Kuiper's mission. Um, Project Kuiper is an initiative to increase the global broadband access through the satellite constellation of these more than 3,200 satellites in low Earth orbit. Its mission is to deliver fast affordable connectivity to unserved and underserved communities around the world. The Kuiper system will deliver fast and latency on par with the existing terrestrial network. And like many other Amazon products and services, Project Kuiper is designed to affordable affordable for the customers because we want to be accessible as many as customers as possible. Please go to the next slide. Project Kuiper will serve individual household as well as school, business, hospitals, and other organizations operating in the locations without reliable broadband services. And Project Kuiper will also provide backhaul solutions for the wireless carriers to extend its LTE or 5G network to new regions. Please go to the next slide. Thank you. We will deploy the more than 3,200 satellites in low Earth orbit at the three altitude of the 590 kilometer, 610 kilometer, and 630 kilometers. Coverage of the project Kuiper will be 56 degree north to the 50 degree south of the equator which allows us to reach about the 95% of the world's population. And then the satellite relay the customer data traffic to the, our ground of infrastructure on the earth and then connecting to the internet, public cloud and private networks. This is how Kuiper network works. 
Please go to the next slide. In March, we revealed our three customer terminal models, which are groundbreaking in terms of performance and affordability. These state-of-the-art antennas designed by the Amazon engineers include uh, the most smallest one, ultra compact one, which has uh, only 80 centimeter square antennas. That's, uh, I, I believe it's a very incredible engineering. And then um, it can deliver the up to 100 megabps connection. And then largest one will deliver the up to one gigabps speed. Please go to the next slide. Last Friday, our launch partner at the United Launch Alliance successfully launched Kuiper's very first two proto flights with the Atlas V rocket. This was a very, uh, uh, very one of our key milestones. We are running up the, our satellite manufacturing facility and will begin launching production satellites next year. So we can start to deliver service to the earliest customer by late 2024. That's an overview of our project. Thank you so much. Um, so now that we've heard a little bit about the technological kind of innovation that can help close some of those uh, gaps, I would like to move to um, usage and how we can address the usage gap. So Pablo, I think that you're online. Um, I hope that you have the ability to unmute yourself. If not, send me a message. Um, yes, I, I think, you, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you now, fantastic, great. Um, so could you share a little bit about what Telefonica is doing to address usage? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the, for the opportunity to participate in the panel. Very pleased to, to, to be the, in the IGF again. Um, well, I think that the first idea I would like to transmit is um, um, uh, that the well, the first impression when we talk about digital inclusion is that it, it is a problem of access. And it is true that the um, um, telecommunication networks are the backbone of our societies and economies. And without uh, access, we, we, we cannot, we don't have anything. So the first step are the, are the, the, the infrastructure, not the telecommunication networks. But the truth is that I, I believe that in the last years, we've been observing an evolution in this conversation about digital inclusion. And I think that we, what we are um, observing is that there is a swift uh, from the connectivity gap to the usage gap. Um, following the numbers uh, presented by Atsuko at the beginning, the truth is that now we have 3.2 billion people that are under the footprint of the of a mobile broadband uh, connectivity and uh, do, do not connect to the internet. And so I think that the, the question we have to, to answer is why do we have, do we still having people that under, under the footprint of our connectivity, um, um, of connectivity to, does not connect? And this is the usage gap, no? And so it is important to, to understand what are the reasons uh, for these people to not connect. We've talked about affordability, that's one, of course. Um, maybe they don't connect because uh, uh, they don't know how to connect it. Um, and so we have, uh, we have to improve the skills. Um, maybe they don't connect um, because they don't trust. And so we have to work into the uh, confidence. 
and, and build digital trust. There are many reasons. Also, uh, the gender gap has uh, also been mentioned. But I would like to underline this idea of uh, a swift in the conversation uh, uh, on digital inclusion from the connectivity gap to the usage gap. Um, the second idea I would like to transmit is that uh, I think that the, one of the learnings of the last years uh, connecting uh, 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 the unconnected is that uh, none of us can do it by ourselves. This is an, uh, an idea transmitted by Atsuko also, and this is the idea of partnerships. Um, we need uh, all hands to connect the, the, the unconnected. Of course, the telecom operators, but also the governments and all the stakeholders. I would like to simply mention an example, which is a, a, a use case we've uh, put in place in Peru, which is called Internet para Todos, IPT, which is a, a collaboration, a partnership between ourselves and META and the Inter-American Development Bank. This is just an example of, of this kind of partnerships. So, um, as a conclusion, first idea, uh, the conversation on digital inclusion has evolved from the connectivity gap to the usage gap. This is where now is the, the problem, in my opinion. And second, the idea of partnerships. Uh, we need everybody to work in the, in the same direction to connect the unconnected. Thank you. Back to you. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, Joe, we've covered access, we've covered usage, um, but we've also heard that that's just one part of the puzzle. So how could you, could you talk to us a little bit about how partnerships can also address um, that question of skills? Yes, I can. Is the microphone on? Yeah. Um, I think so. And first, uh, thank you, Japan, for having us here. It's, uh, it's just an amazing event. It's my first IGF. Go figure. Um, and the weather's fantastic. Uh, makes it even nicer. And thank you, ICC, and thank you, fellow panelists. As Disney, I'm a little bit humbled to, to be on with, with Kuiper. Oh my God, the Leo thing is finally happening. There's competition for Elon Musk. It's just amazing. And of course, the ITU presenter framed the problem for us, which was wonderful. Um, Telefonica goes out and actually builds connections. Respect. Um, so I'll just try and do the, the humble Disney uh, contribution uh, to the discussion. Um, so before I get to partnerships, I'm going to back up and ask the question, um, you know, what, what do we do? We don't build connections. We're not a satellite company or a telco. Um, so what do we bring to the table? Well, it, it, we try to bring the demand side to the table, right? So backing up, that means we try to make amazing content and then put it on the internet and drive demand. That's our, that's our thing, that's, I think that's why we're on this panel, um, is that reason. So you know, enter Disney Plus, which launched uh, in 2019, 20, 21, around the world. Um, Middle East, Africa, Asia, Europe, et cetera. Um, and so that's where we can put our product you know, online and help drive demand in particular. Um, 60 countries plus. Um, the, the global content is there, the Lucas, the Marvel, the Pixar, the Disney, the Nat Geo as well. Um, and then that takes us to even better is when you can add in-country content, right? So then Disney Plus allows us to bring, sorry, to make local, kind of hate that word, right? It's, it sounds almost pejorative, so I'll call it in-country content content in the language of that country that we create. We can now do that. We're playing in that space. We have a Korean show we just made called Moving. It's a uh, like Korean superhero espionage. It's doing really well all across Asia. It's doing well on Hulu in the US. It's uh, 
it's so it's, so it's not only Korean content in Korea, it's exporting Korean content, which is even better, right? Driving demand, you know, around the world. India, we, we, we do great in India. We've, we had the star brand in India for a couple decades. Uh, I'm sure anyone from India, it's really vibrant Indian content, Indian people making Indian content for Indian people. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, now we can do it through Disney Plus. Um, um, we have scale in that market. It's India's credit that they've let us in, right? There's another large country that doesn't let companies like mine in. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a Gandhi quote, which goes, I'll paraphrase, it goes something like this. It's, you should have a house that is built strongly enough so that you can throw open the windows and the doors and let the breezes come through. So applied to our industry that we're allowed to come in and make content in the language. Um, it's fantastic. Um, all right, I'm now going to uh, segue into uh, three questions for the room. We can, the panelists included, Rose, you too. If you answer the three questions collectively, then, um, um, then what? Uh, I will give everyone a Disney token <coughs> or a tchotchke of some sort. So I'm going to read a quote, and if you can identify the quote, this picks up on the in-country language. If you can identify who said the quote, that's the first question, and then there'll be two following questions. So the quote is, if you speak to a person in a language they understand, you speak to their head. If you speak to them in their language, their language, you speak to their heart. Don't have to raise your hand. Just shout it out. Anyone? Very famous person. I'll give you the continent. Africa. Still no one. Mandela. Yes, that's one. Now that one was easier. The next one's a little harder. But I think doable. Uh, what language was he talking about? If for him, for he himself, what language was his first language? Also. Who said that? Also. There you go, Bertrand. That's two. That was the, probably the harder one. This last one's easy, and it comes back to the Walt Disney Company. Which movie did the character did the was Kosa a significant part? Disney movie. Thank you, Helen. Yes, Black Panther, of course. Yeah. Um, so that, that's our piece of this, is to drive the demand. And if you can do it in the in-country, creating in-country content, then you know, you're even more home and dry in, in, in motivating that demand. I'll end my, this part of the, of the panel um, by plugging another panel. It's at 5.30. It's on the main stage. Uh, Burton, what's it called again? And it will feature some producers uh, from Kampala, Uganda. Yes, two female, young female producers, two sisters have been producing local content in the region, for the region, in local languages, including Uganda and, of course, Swahili. All right, so that's, that, that's a way better story than I could think of, and it's just a, a nice happenstance. It's coming up at 5.30 on the main stage. Back to you, Rose. There we go. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> you may find that a lot of people suddenly turn up in the room at the end. Um, great. So you actually just lined up um, really perfectly the next person who can join us. So Machuki, I hope that you are uh, able to unmute yourself. Um, so you just touched on the idea of uh, or the importance of adapting content to the local context. And Atsuko uh, began by breaking down the state of connectivity across countries. That makes it really clear that connecting the unconnected means very different things in different places. Um, I was hoping that you could speak to us a little bit about how we ensure that efforts to expand connectivity are responsive to local specificities and needs. Thank you, and I hope you can hear me. 
We're all good. We can hear you. Great. All right. Um, first, I'd like to start by thanking the ICC for inviting us, uh, the Internet Society, uh, to this session because it's a key area of interest for us and a focus area for our work because it's very much aligned to our vision that the internet is for everyone. Now, um, to the question um, on expanding connectivity and uh, with the need to make it more aligned to the needs of people in rural and underserved areas. The one thing that we've come to realize is that um, there is a need for innovative approaches that can complement uh, the traditional models for providing access. And because it's evident that um, connecting people in rural, remote, and underserved areas, and even in some cases, low-income areas, presents a challenge to the traditional models uh, that provide connectivity, especially from a business operations perspective, and more specifically on the return on investments. So it makes it much harder for, those, for the traditional models to, uh, to extend connectivity to these areas. Now, I'd like to set us perspective or sort of um, reset our thinking to understand what we mean when we talk about connectivity and what the internet is. Most of us understand that the internet is a network of networks. Essentially, what this means is that we have networks um, or individual networks that are using different technologies that come and interconnect together to make what we know as the global internet. Now, if we look at this from the context of those people who are living in remote and underserved areas, the way to do this in a sustainable way is to anchor the network or to build a network from those communities and then interconnect with the existing internet. And by doing so, it means that we are having to establish or anchor that connectivity based on the realities of people living in those areas. And that means that we have to consider the various social, economic, and um, other factors um, that exist or prevail in, those, in the areas that they are in. There was a study that was done uh, or paper produced going back to 1998. And it sort of said that, or the, the, the headline here was that the first uh, looking at those areas or the underserved areas as the first mile of connectivity. So today, um, you know, over years, uh, those areas have been looked as, as uh, the last mile, but essentially, if we were to look at them as the first mile, it means we're building from the community outward. Now, there's a lot of work that has been gone into developing and piloting this kind of approach where you're looking from the community outbound. Um, there's been, and those approaches have done deployment and uh, tested this kind of deployments in different environments, topologies, settings, both rural and urban, and as high as 3,800 meters above sea level uh, on the foothills of Mount Everest, where there are some villages that look, need connectivity. And there's some work we've done there and are trying to, ex to learn from that experience. The objective here is to understand the challenges and the opportunities and how we can refine these models to be able to bring connectivity to those who need it the most um, and make sure that it's sustainable and scalable. There are a few things that we faced um, and uh, in helping to design this model to make sure that it is um, basically adapts to those areas or to to those um, uh, communities that, it, they are, that are being connected. And I'll just like to touch on a few of them. First, we make sure that the model looks at technology from an agnostic perspective. It's technology ag agnostic, meaning that it can use and adapt any technology that best serves the needs. It also adapts a nonprofit approach in order to address some of the challenges that hinder the adoption. And I think the issue of use has been mentioned by um, a previous speaker. And basically issues like digital literacy falls under that, training, technical support, and so on. So the model for, that we use when we talk about community networks really helps to address some of these local issues. Affordability is another challenge. And so the, 
um, model that they use for charging fees is one that's designed to be beneficial to the community. An important aspect of this is that these networks are less extractive than the traditional ways of connecting uh, people. Because the network is owned by the community, it means only a portion of the fees that are paid for connectivity are actually used to extend, uh, to, to, um, to pay for a backhaul capacity. The rest of the funds are actually kept within the community. And then they are used for other elements that are needed for developing the community to be able to take advantage or leverage the use of that connectivity. And most importantly, it is anchored within the social economic pillars of that community. So schools, uh, health facilities, the local government, the local institutions, cultural institutions, and also addressing the um, arts and entertainment that are key to that community. Now, there are some opportunities that we need to look at going forward. Key to this is policy. Um, there's a need for many countries and many places around the world to develop policy and regulation that recognizes um, these new models or complementary uh, uh, access solutions like community networks, because it empowers them to be able to go and engage with licensed operators, to be able to connect to the rest of the internet. They need to be able to build infrastructure. So if they need rights of way, this makes it much easier. And in some situations, access to financial uh, services. Once they are recognized, it's much easier for banks and other uh, financial institutions to uh, pay attention to these um, solutions and give them funding. Of course, um, Access to funding is a critical issue. And right now there are emerging conversations around how we, the use of universal service fund can help support the initial deployment and extension of complementary access solutions. Backhaul still remains to be a challenge. We are very much excited about the deployment of uh, new technologies like LEOs because uh, the cost and uh, availability of backhaul has been one of the big challenges that make community and complementary access solutions to be less sustainable. So we are hoping that is going to change. So I'd like to conclude uh, by saying, of course, and before I conclude, uh, the content element is key. Most important is making the content relevant to those people that are actually getting connected for the very first time. So why should they spend money to get connected um, when they, they have uh, low um, incomes? Um, and, and so they have to draw a balance between the money they have to spend on other things and money that they have to use for access. So as I conclude, uh, at the Internet Society, we are very keen to see information about developing and deploying community networks and other complementary access solutions becoming common knowledge in the very same way that it's common knowledge for many communities around the world who don't have access to potable water to know that they can collaborate and find partners to support them in digging a borehole to get access to the water. In our experience, and we are working collaboratively with other partners, we are planning to produce a do-it-yourself toolkit in 2024 that is based on all the experience which we've gained in the deployments that we've had uh, across the world. And we are hoping that that will sort of help uh, anyone who wants to support or living in a community to know the path to take to build, own, and operate an internet infrastructure and connect it with other networks for the benefits of those communities that are yet to be connected. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, Anika, I'm gonna to turn to you next. Um, Matuki just spoke to us about the challenge that um, connecting people in rural areas particularly creates for traditional business models. Um, the Global Dish Inclusion Partnership leverages multi-stakeholder partnerships as a way to kind of deal with this. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role that those partnerships play? Certainly. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for um, hosting this important conversation.
So uh, Global Digital Inclusion Partnership, uh, we work on uh, policy and regulatory frameworks to advance meaningful connectivity for the global majority specifically. And we do this by bringing together uh, different stakeholders um, at uh, national level as well as at um, regional and uh, global levels to bring uh, government as well as private sector and civil society to begin to look at uh, an opportunity for building this. So for, as an example, um, we obviously use uh, research to inform uh, the policy frameworks that we want uh, to gain support for. So I'll give you an example with um, the 2% target that the first speaker spoke about on uh, affordability in terms of how that was built. Um, it was, it, and it, it basically is a, a, a target that is one for two, meaning that one gig of data should not cost more than 2% average monthly income. And that was actually informed through uh, research that was done in 20, 2012 and 2013. In 2014, uh, we were able to get uh, multiple stakeholders in Ghana and Nigeria to actually uh, get their governments to endorse this as a minimum standard even before ITU uh, adopted this as a minimum standard. So that's uh, sort of been our model. But apart from that, I just want to just divert a little bit from, from how we get to that, to talk a little bit about why it's important uh, for us to be inclusive even in our solutions. Because multi-stakeholderism is about making sure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute and, and have a voice in this. One of the uh, missing conversations in the digital divides conversations we've been having has been the economic impact of leaving certain stakeholders behind in our digital development. And I'm gonna highlight in particular women. What is it costing governments and economies to leave women behind? A simplistic view is for those of you who love soccer, let's say rugby, because you know we're in the World Cup and I was very disappointed a few days ago that I couldn't find anyone willing to watch the game with me a couple of days ago. But uh, Rugby World Cup, who's your favorite team? Say South Africa, please. <laughs> we're the best. Okay, so your favorite uh, soccer team, rugby team. If we were to take half of the team and bench it, could you still win? Doesn't matter whether it's your best players or worst players, just half the team bench it, your chances of winning are actually non-existent at that moment. That's actually what is happening with us not paying attention to the digital gender gap that every conversation we've had here at um, IGF has told us it's actually growing. So there is an economic impact and we've actually done a study uh, working with uh, different communities to look at what is the economic impact of leaving uh, women behind. So the digital gender gap is actually estimated to be costing a trillion dollars in GDP uh, over 10 years in about 32 of the low and middle income countries uh, that we studied. In 2020, this uh, represents $126 billion lost and about $24 billion in tax revenue that is lost. You know, when a woman is unable to use the web uh, to get an education, to access healthcare, to build networks, uh, she has fewer opportunities and everyone pays a price for that. So I think it's, it's really critical for us as we, we continue to talk about closing the gaps to really also think about how are we being inclusive even in that process? One of the, the, the uh, common sayings I love from civil society in, in South Africa is uh, nothing for us without us. The importance of engaging those stakeholders when we are building for them. And I think, you know, uh, we've had examples and good hard knock lessons uh, the digital centers that were built because we thought people in the rural areas needed digital centers. And so we applied a build it and they will come uh, uh, approach. And we built 
and the digital centers are now just kind of sitting there not being heavily utilized. And, and I think now we are beginning to slowly start talking about this usage gap because while infrastructure is important and we still have a long ways to go, addressing the demand side issues is equally important because we want people to connect to the internet to do what? It's not for the vibes. We want them to connect to the internet so that they're able to use it in a way that they can help transform their lives. One of my favorite stories was uh, a young boy who was a beneficiary of a public Wi-Fi program in uh, the city of Tswane in South Africa, who when he was interviewed, why it was important for him to walk so far to the nearest hotspot to connect, his response was that he lives in a shack, and when he's online, he no longer lives in a shack. Let that sink in. We have an opportunity and a tool to really empower people in a way that's transformative. The people who need this kind of transformation in their lives the most are the 2.6 billion people who are actually offline at the moment. So I don't wanna to be too preachy about this, so, but wh where do we go from here and how do we build forward? I think the, the biggest thing we have to come together and agree on both private sector, government, and civil society is that we need to raise the bar on affordability. We've been working on affordability since 2014 for some of us and others much longer. You saw the graph showing how many countries have actually achieved affordability. And we are talking about 2%. But let me remind you of something that's even said about this 2%. We are talking about 2% for one gig per month. What meaningful activity can any of us do, being able to only afford one gig per month uh, for connectivity? Certainly not the things that we were required to do during the lockdowns of COVID. You cannot take a course and actually you know, finish with one gig per month. You cannot attend meetings. Uh, there's just so much that cannot be done. So we need to raise the bar from a policy point of view on this standard for affordability. And look at the meaningful connectivity standard, which tells us that we need to aim for people being able to have daily use of the internet if they want to. At the moment, we are still defining a connected person as someone who accesses the internet once every three months. So we are doing all of this, but our standards are so, so low, and we are calculating the gaps based on very low standards, which means that the picture is actually even worse than it really is if we were to use a meaningful connectivity standard. So daily access, daily use, unlimited access to data is a standard we should be pushing for. Adequate skills for connectivity, investing in the skills. A minimum standard on a device that is you know, uh, suitable for meaningful connectivity, smart, a smart device, let's just say that, we won't say phone, but a smart device that is affordable. One of the studies we also did was uh, device affordability. In the continent of Africa, we are still spending 40 to 60% average household income on one device. So device affordability is a big issue. A lot of the solutions that have been introduced are financing of devices. That is not affordability. It's you can't afford it now, but over six months you will afford it. We need people to be able to afford. So we need to really work around innovative solutions, whether it's local assembly uh, or, or reducing of digital taxation on the devices themselves as a way to uh, really spare uptake of um, uh, digital technologies. And um, you know, skills I've already mentioned, and an adequate speed. Um, at, at least 4G level. If we truly are talking about people being able to do the things that Joe was enticing us about, uh, you know, the content that um, is uh, dynamic and vibrant, we need to admit that we have to raise the bar on the standards. And this requires policy uh, uh, approach for us. And lastly, we have to mainstream gender in ICT policies. It is not acceptable 
that we continue to have a gap that is growing. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, we do that by the, a, a framework uh, that was actually developed by women called the REACT framework. We need a rights-based approach towards ICT development. Rights-based approach because women experience violence online. There's safety issues, there's privacy issues, and some of the gap is caused, yes, by lack of affordability, but also by women uh, censoring themselves out of participating because of the experience that they have when they connect online. We need to invest in education for the digital skills so that um, everyone is able to truly participate at minimum level and, and maybe define what is a digitally literate person the same way we did with um, the ABC's education. Digital education, what is a digitally literate person and how do we define that and how do we work towards uh, achieving that? We need to really double down on access. One of the, I, I joked the other day saying that the running theme here at IGF is we are running out of time, but usually that's because the sessions are always running late. We are running out of time. But we truly are running out of time. You saw the SDGs and the schedule. We are running out of time of connecting everyone. Uh, we are running out of time of making sure that we reach universal access. Four, over $400 billion is estimated for infrastructure uh, that's still needed for infrastructure investment to connect everyone. Even if private sector could put up half of that, we still need government to prioritize uh, investment in digital development and in infrastructure in particular. Uh, so it's going to take the public-private partnerships, it's going to take everyone actually uh, contributing to this. Uh, so access and affordability. And affordability, we have to also admit that there may be communities that might never be able to afford even at the 2%. And so initiatives like the one that the previous speaker was talking about of community networks are really important. We have to be open to different digital models as well as different financial models for connecting the unconnected. We have to focus on content, so that's part of the REACT, R-E-A-C, so content for C. Um, local content, but content in languages that people can understand and can operate in. Like, clear, seriously, we don't want to connect everyone for them to read English online. Most of the content right now is in English. I come from a continent where majority of the, peop of the population does not speak English. So content is really important, and, and it has a, an economic opportunity as well, because content economy is quite a thing. Right? We don't want to only just be consumers online, we also want to be innovators and produce uh, and develop content as well. And last, uh, the T in the REACT framework is about setting targets. We can't measure something that we did not set a target, we did not benchmark. We need to set targets and be intentional about closing, especially the digital gender gap. It exists because of the inequalities that already exist in our society. It's not just a divide that is an online or an ICT divide. So we have to be intentional about fixing those. So, so it's a good starting point is looking at broad national broadband plans and seeing if they specifically address any gender issues. Quite a number of broadband plans are still quite mute on gender or women or just actually going the extra mile to ensure that women are uh, included uh, in the digital economy that we all are talking about now. So I will just pause there to say, you know, react, um, rights-based education, access and affordability content, and setting realistic policy targets to actually connect those who are not connected um, is where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next we have Giacomo, who's joining us online. I hope that he can unmute himself. Um, Anika, we've just heard quite a lot about the gender digital divide and the fact that when people go online, they may not feel safe. The other, and that may have a chilling effect. And the other aspect of this is also security online. If they don't feel like the online space is secure, they may just not engage with it. Um, Giacomo, I would really, love for you to speak a little bit about how we make sure that a lack of security doesn't have that kind of chilling effect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I'll assume you can, unless you tell me otherwise. 
thank you so much to the ICC for inviting me. It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to, to be here today and, and speak uh, on this great panel. It's always challenging to be the last speaker because uh, I had prepared a bunch of notes and, you know, as speakers were, you know, had previous panels were uh, presenting, I had to kind of delete uh, points to avoid repetitions. Um, but I still hope that I can add some, some value here. And I actually want to go back to, to where we started, uh, if you want, uh, to tackle your question. Um, about the links between connectivity, digital technology, and, and the SDGs. And I will start with uh, uh, you know, uh, a quote by the uh, UN Deputy Secretary General uh, that at the opening of the Sustainable Development Goals Digital Day in New York about a month ago, said that digital technologies, when used safely and responsibly, can be catalysts for economic, social, and societal transformation by creating efficiencies at scale and expanding the reach of existing solutions to support more people. Now, I find this very a very interesting uh, uh, quote because we've heard so many times how digital technologies can have this catalyst effect and can be accelerators for, for SDGs. But this was uh, the first time that I saw so clearly and so explicitly a reference to responsible and safe use. And what does, you know, responsibly and safety, you know, and safely actually, actually mean in this context? For, first and foremost, we should take this as applicable to all stakeholders that are part of kind of the, the, the uh, connectivity ecosystem from users to companies, to governments. This is really, uh, it's a shared responsibility and everyone should really uh, uh, take, take its, own, uh, its own part of the, uh, of the bargain here and make sure that they deliver. But what does, you know, what does actually be responsible and, and be safe mean? And going back to something that I believe uh, 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 also Pablo mentioned earlier is about earning and, and building digital trust. So people have to trust in order to connect. They have to trust the technology itself. Um, they have to trust the companies that are behind the technology. And they also have to trust the governments that in their roles, both as regulators and as service providers, have to create a safety net around a protection net around around users. Without this this combined effect, it's going to be very difficult to, um, uh, in a way, build that trust that is that is needed and kind of uh, mitigate the chilling effect. Because the chilling effect can occur in two ways. It can occur if users and people feel unsafe and you know, unprotected on the internet, but they can also be on the other side of the coin, they might not be willing to connect if they feel that there is an abuse or a misuse of the powers of companies or of governments that in a way take, uh, uh, um, you know, in this asymmetric kind of power distribution, they, they might, you know, they may perceive, users may perceive a uh, threat to, to uh, respect of their own, of their own rights. Um, they're uncertain about what's going to happen to their personal information and data. So security is a very important point, but it's also a very delicate one that needs to really uh, uh, be taken into consideration from the beginning. And this is what I want to focus on because we've heard about the importance of affordability, of access, of inclusivity and reducing the gap. I want to add another, another important parameter here, which is uh, the parameter of uh, preparedness. So I believe that um, you know, it is very important if we focus on the role of governments, that governments not only invest in ensuring the connectivity, so the ability of people to connect, but they, they do so without overlooking um, or without taking shortcuts when it comes to really developing the preparedness of the whole kind of system to be able to absorb this, this innovation and increased connectivity. I just want to 
uh, uh, you know, reference. There was a, a, a recent report by uh, the Economic Commission for Africa that highlighted how, the, uh, relatively speaking, for the African continent, the low level of preparedness in cybersecurity costed about 10% of national GDP. So now that, that is a significant uh, um, number if you think that on one hand, connectivity can boost uh, social and economic development, but on the other hand, the lack of preparedness, the lack of an appropriate um, cybersecurity ecosystem at the national level can actually slow down or potentially even reverse the positive effect that uh, uh, connectivity and digital technologies can actually bring. So what does preparedness actually mean in this context? I think that we have to, to look holistically at, at the whole of government, like it was mentioned at the very beginning, and that's why I said I would like to finish from where we started. All of government approach is important. It means fundamentally intervening at, uh, um, I would say, five different levels. The policy and regulatory part is, is key. You need to have, governments need to have policies and regulations that enable and support innovation, but at the same time, create the kind of the safety and, 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 and security uh, um, regulatory ecosystem that allows the responsible and safe use of these technologies. There have to be the other layer that follows policy and regulation is a layer of, of of processes, of operations. We've heard how public-private partnerships are incredibly powerful tools that can be leveraged you know, to uh, really boost connectivity and uh, kind of a, uh, development and absorption of these uh, digital technologies. Now, these uh, public-private partnerships, they have to be structured. They have to be, um, in a way, uh, um, put within a framework that allows them that allows them to work. And you cannot wait until you need a public-private partnership to work, to worry about establishing the frameworks that allow you to start with, to have this, these partnerships. Structures are also an important layer. So we we'll go back to safety and, and security. You cannot really uh, you know, think in, in 2023 to invest heavily in boosting your connectivity if you're not equally ready to invest in building your own capacity to deal with uh, uh, incidents and emergencies that happen in the digital domain. So being able to build computer emergency response teams or computer incident uh, uh, response teams that can work you know, at the public level, can work in cooperation with private sectors, et cetera, it's, it's key. So you need, really need to invest in, in building this, these structures that ultimately deliver that feeling of safety and security to individuals. If you're asking me to trust e-banking because it's safer than traditional banking and you're asking me to put all of my savings online, I want to be sure that those savings are protected from uh, criminal and malicious actors that you know, maybe want to take advantage uh, of me, of, of my perhaps lack of skills or, or knowledge, but I also want to make sure that the, you know, there is someone that I can rely on that protects that critical infrastructure and critical services. And then, of course, it was mentioned skills. Skills is important globally. There is a shortage of, of cyber skills and cybersecurity skills, so uh, it's going to be hard, but nevertheless, it is important that significant investment is done in skills, not only to enable connectivity and, and, and teach uh, and develop the skills that would allow people to meaningfully engage with uh, services and content online, but there is also the need to invest on developing basic digital security or cyber hygiene skills to really, through public campaigns, through education already in schools, making sure that we invest in, in building that foundational knowledge that would actually enable people to safely and securely engage uh, online. And last but not least, it's, it's technology. Now, technology is always being considered as a potentially kind of a, a high barrier for some developing countries. And the idea that it would put a lot of uh, 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 pressure on them to be able to equip themselves with the technological solutions that are needed to protect 
and monitor and keep the digital environment safe. However, it is important that uh, it is not, um, uh, we do not let the, the challenges in a way prevent us from even engaging on the discussion of how, it is, how important it is that potentially by leveraging some public-private partnerships, governments um, equip themselves with the technological capabilities to be able to uh, protect and monitor and protect their own networks. Because digital connectivity is, is fundamental, is key, can have so many positive effects, but it also, in a way, uh, expands significantly the attack surface or the entry points for malicious actors to uh, really target individuals or societies at large. So it is really important that we do not consider security as a cost line that needs to be minimized, uh, but it's actually an asset. It's an investment that ultimately we need really to take seriously in order for it to to uh, uh, um, pay dividends and, and uh, make sure that people and institutions and companies can enjoy the benefits of an open, safe, and secure online environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to let the panelists know. I think we're a little bit behind our schedule, so I'm going to deviate from the plan um, and actually begin straight away with the Q&A. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit and take advantage of my role as moderator to ask the first question. Um, so I'd like to kind of go back to Giacomo's point about structuring partnerships. I mean, it's, every speaker today has agreed that one way or another, um, we can't work in silos. We need to work together. Every stakeholder, be they government or private sector, has a role to play. So whether you call it whole of society approach, ecosystem approach, um, can you talk a little bit more about the kind of the way that we need to structure those roles and structure those partnerships. And I think I will hand the mic to you, first of all, Takashi. Oh, thanks. Yep, actually, yeah. <laughs> I would like to talk about uh, Kaipa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we are paying a lot of efforts for the successful project launch and the service start in the near future. And then uh, Amazon is investing that $10 billion. The number is a little bit smaller than $400 billion. <laughs> but uh, we are investing a lot. Uh, but uh, um, we believe that uh, uh, we will be more successful if we can get a more partnership from the both of the private sector and the public sector. We are perfectly committed to working with the partner of those who can share our common uh, concept of the bridging the digital divide. So. We believe, we think partnership will take uh, many variety of, of forms. Uh, for example, for the private sector, uh, it can be the partnership with the uh, wireless carrier to extend its LTE and 5G networks to the new regions. It is uh, one of the form of the partnership. Actually, last month, we announced the partnership with the Vodafone and Vodacom. Uh, they are going to use Kuiper services to extend its their network uh, for in the region of the Europe and Africa. And yeah, we are very excited to see how the partnership can improve the network in those regions. And uh, we are looking forward to, of course, partnering with others. And then for the public sector, yeah, our ability to connect customers requires access to the KA band radio frequency and the regulations that enable modern satellite technology. We 
expect public sector support in both of country level and international level. From the spectrum access and the necessary licenses in each country to the international regula radio regulations update, uh, which can enable modern satellite like a customer to fulfill its potential ability to bridge the digital divide. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to ask if anyone has a question to please come forward to the mic, and we'll actually start with one online. Um, so um, I have in mind someone to answer this, but please, after, after I ask that person, any of the panelists should jump in. Um, so the question was, when we're talking about skills to engage with digital technologies, what skills do we mean? Um, Joe, I think that it would be great if you could give the opening answer to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, forgive me for defaulting to just giving a little bit of a what you know what we do um, answer to that, which is you know, we'll, we'll enter any given market with the service that Disney Plus mentioned, and we'll we'll just try and be good partners as we as we come in with the service. We'll we'll, we'll partner with the in country telcos, uh, be a good partner to the creative industry, the part of the ecosystem. Um, uh, with with the policymakers, and just so that w we have the reputation of like, oh, these these guys are part of the fabric of our of our community. Uh, that's good for our business, and it's and it's good for the for the country in question. And then we try and do a little more uh, on top of that. That's just like the the threshold. So the more part would be to actually do uh, projects. So we'll fund an NGO or work with a government to do, we've got projects in 20 different countries, and we'll do di digital literacy projects or online safety projects with the NGO or with, with government. So I'll give uh, two examples. One would be uh, in Indonesia. We partner with a firm called, an uh, NGO called Ganara, and they go around to schools and they train, uh, the, they, they, they work with the kids in the classroom to um, uh, do the digital literacy, so the, the, the bullying and issues like that. And, and they do it through art, like pen on paper, you know, uh, old school art as a way to uh, bring um, the Indonesian children up the curve on digital, digital literacy matters. And then a related one for us is in Latin America where we have Chico.net, which works across the region, training the teachers to then do the similar thing as I described for Indonesia. Um, so those are two, two different uh, approaches that we take here. If that's responsive. Thank you. That's fantastic. Would anyone else, either in the room or online, to pick up on this question? Just as a reminder, that was um, when we're talking about skills to engage with digital technologies, what skills do we mean? Um, let me just humanize that question a little bit and share what we have learned about what people do online when they have the right connectivity, the speed, and the, the know-how to, to utilize uh, these. And this is all part of our cost of exclusion study where we took several countries and we did qualitative research and ethnographic studies to really dig deep and humanize the economic impact of the exclusion. So this is from the women who are online who were included and what we learned in West Africa in, in particular. Uh, the women were using the internet uh, three times, um, you know, the internet for every three men that were using the internet, only two women were. But those who were, these are the things they were accomplishing. They were able to utilize the internet uh, and report that during COVID-19, they did not lose income because they were able to convert their, their business of selling on, at the market by being able to uh, create uh, WhatsApp groups and sell their goods online as well. Those who were online reported 
uh, seven times more than those who are not online, having completed uh, and upgrade, upgraded their skills by taking a course online and being able to improve uh, their job skills um, by being able to be uh, connected. And a lot of the uses were really connected to their financial ability to be able to take care of themselves and their families. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I'm going to just answer it from that point of view to say, yes, it's about digital skills, but maybe we need a broader conversation around, is that coding, is that skills to be able to operate mobile money, is that a skill to be able to run your business online? Uh, but, you know, with the right device, the right connectivity, and the skills, what the theme we are seeing is that women in particular are able to preserve economic, uh, an ability to earn economically in, uh, during periods of crisis, such as the one we've recently had with the pandemic. Great, thank you so much. So I'm aware that we've got about 10 minutes left only, just under. Um, so I wanna give everyone the chance to kind of make a final a final statement, um, because I've kind of cut you off from your previous content, which you were supposed to share. So um, I'm actually going to start with Atsuko, if that's OK. Um, and if I can request that people keep their, their comment to about one minute, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Perhaps I can combine my uh, contribution to answer the skills question as well as the closing remarks. And I think this question on what skills is very important. I earlier mentioned about connecting the unconnected, but in fact, the, there is a very dynamic and fast moving of uh, technological development such as AI and data analytics, and it's going to affect these connected and unconnected communities alike. So the knowledge and skills perhaps we need to address the reality in front of us would be different from what we um, anticipated, let's say five years ago. Um, just very quickly give you an example. There are already jobs which may, be, um, uh, may become redundant or the jobs that may be created. And without the necessary and new digital skills, perhaps um, the people would have tough time. So I believe that we would need to revisit what are the digital literacy and digital skills that will be required in the new, new, new normal that we are seeing in front of us. And I hope that that includes um, the AI solutions as well as the need for data and data intensive decision making, which we are surrounded with in uh, e-commerce or the traffic management or asset management and the, the mobile banking as earlier a speaker said. So I hope that um, this will leave a question and the cautious, cautious optimism uh, that perhaps together in partnership, we can address uh, in uh, and move forward. Thank you, back to you. Thank you so much. So next I'm gonna go to you, Takashi. Yeah. <laughs> yep, uh, thank you. Maybe, yeah, I can say to that, yeah, we are, we are going for um, to bridge the digital device strongly. Yeah, just, we, we will do that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, next on the list, I have Pablo. Yes, thank you, Rose. Well, I'd like to congratulate all the panelists and you, Rose, because uh, um, we have identified everything. We have all the ingredients on the table. Um, um, for example, the technologies. We now have the technologies to connect everybody. It, it is not a problem of technology. We've mentioned uh, structure. I think that it is maybe uh, uh, not the thing. I mean, we have to understand that 
what works somewhere may not work somewhere else. And maybe that is the, the, the thing. We have to find the flexibility to, to find the correct solution for the correct uh, uh, place. And maybe this is the case. We have all the ingredients and what is the, maybe the, the, the common ground? The common thing is that we have to work all together to connect the unconnected. And this is the, the solution. We have the ingredients, we have the recipe, and what, what, what we have to do is, work, is to work all, all together to, to connect the, the, the unconnected. That's the thing, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Joe. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll end with, um, with uh, an affirmation of, um, of the multilateral, multi-stakeholder uh, approach. Um, 9,000 people here this week and uh, you know, dealing with existing issues and new ones like AI. It's, um, and it's my first and it's, uh, it's been amazing and it's a real, uh, it's a real treat. And then, and then this panel, uh, academia, civil society, industry, different parts of industry um, coming together on, a, on an important issue like this. And uh, I learned uh, a, a famous South African quote today that I'll use in future presentations, which is, nothing for us without us. Yes. Thank you. Machuki, can I ask you to come in next? Yes, thank you, Rose. I think um, in conclusion, as Pablo has rightfully noted, the solutions are there. Now we need to go to the next step. And the next step is that we need to scale up the efforts meaning that we need to be able to scale this up to have the impact that it needs to have. And that's going to be possible by increasing the funding that's available towards the deployments of the solutions that have been identified. It's not the technology, it's about getting more people connected. And so that needs to start happening. Um, we also need to increase the partnerships because it's an essential component and ingredient for the success as almost every other uh, panelist here has rightfully noted that um, we cannot individually do it alone and it needs a lot of collaboration and partnerships to be able to achieve that goal. And so if we're able to scale, um, make sure that we get the funding, the partnerships, I believe that it's possible to achieve the 2030 vision of having everyone connected. And we as the Internet Society are, um, are pretty much uh, here to support and collaborate with everyone to, uh, to help achieve that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm now going to uh, ask Anika to give her summary. Um, so the gaps that exist today are actually a consequence of uh, policy choices that we have either make or don't make. So I'm going to challenge us that we must work with policymakers uh, to look at narrowing the gaps. Um, and one that we didn't talk much about is uh, rural v urban uh, divide. So engaging rural communities in the broadband policy agenda to make sure that uh, we are not leaving people in rural and remote areas behind. Embedding meaningful connectivity indicators with key ICT statistics so that we are going beyond basic access to actually make sure that we are measuring uh, based on meaningful connectivity. And lastly, we need to leverage public access solutions uh, in order to provide affordable and meaningful resources to rural and remote areas in particular. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And then Giacomo, can I ask for your summary now? Absolutely, and I'll be very brief. I think it is, it is important that we consider connectivity not as the end of the journey or the point of arrival, but a point of departure and the new beginning. And to do that, it is important that um, we invest in preparedness. Again, stressing the, the importance of being prepared to what connectivity is actually going to mean and bring to, to society. And skills, as was mentioned, it's a big part of that. 
I don't think there is a single answer to what are the right skills, depending which community you're talking about. Those needs will be different, but definitely basic uh, cyber hygiene skills for all users are going to be needed. We're going to have potentially 2. Point, you know, 4, 2.6 billion new people connected that have not, were not connected before. And these people have to, to be upskilled to make sure that they, be, they, they do so safely and, and responsibly. But at the same time, governments have to, to improve their digital skills and their, their digital knowledge skills so that they can engage with other governments, you know, on par. And really, skills is a very complex effort that should be uh, uh, taken forward as a key pillar of preparedness. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I think it would be impossible to summarize everything, but just to kind of quickly run through the last takeaways. Um, I think that the message for all of us is that we need to go fast, be flexible. We need to defend and uphold the multi-stakeholder model. Um, we need better indicators, and we need to focus on rural areas. Um, and then there was also a bit of a challenge to governments as well, because obviously skills are something that can be delivered by many different people, but um, particularly it would be great to see a focus on cyber hygiene, I think was another thing that came up. It's great. <clears throat> and then finally, it's clear that really what everyone is asking for is the whole ecosystem approach for everyone to move together. Um, so I guess that that's a bit of a call of action to all of you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists today. That was fantastic. And thank you to everyone in the audience for participating.